I'm joined by Dan Senor. Dan is the host of the Call Me Back podcast. He returns. Good morning, Dan. It is great to see you. Happy New Year to you on this January 2nd. Thank you, Hugh. I don't know about a happy New Year. 2023 have, has been pretty rough for those in my world, in my corner of the world, uh, my family, my friends in Israel. But uh, I'm hoping at least for a happier New Very Year. Well put. Dan, last night, the Fetching Mrs. Hugh and I had dinner with four friends, Toby and and Bob, who've been our friends forever. We met in the St. Petersburg um, Central Synagogue 10, 15 years ago. A couple of their friends, Dave and Marcy. Marcy has 100 relatives in Israel. Her grandfather escaped from Russia in 1918, went to Israel. The American Jewish community is so connected to Israel. And you, by the way, when you come to the West Coast, let me know. They'll try and set something up for anyone you want to talk to. But have you had an incredible outpouring of interest in Call Me Back as a result of 10-7? Yeah, in ways that I could uh, not have possibly imagined. Um, the the number of downloads, uh, unique downloads since we since October 7th has gone up, I don't know, five, six, seven times. My, my uh, producer, Alon, tracks the data pretty religiously i don't i stay away from looking at the data because i don't want it to um you know influence i don't want to get in my in the head in my head as i think about how to construct these conversations but uh but yeah there's been there's been enormous interest it's and i'll tell you hugh i think it's for two reasons one i think the jewish community in the diaspora has been rattled has been shaken allies they once thought they had particularly more on the among progressive jews they realize they don't have any more they're alone and so they're looking for sources of information. They're looking for community. And I think our podcast has provided both. And then the the other group of people, I would say, are people who aren't necessarily Jewish or have been in, had any reason to be connected to Israel, but recognize the U.S. and Israel have shared values, in many respects have a shared history, certainly have shared strategic interests. And this, this Gaza-Israel war, this Hamas-Israel war, feels different than previous Israel wars in previous israel skirmishes whether on its northern border or the southern border this feels bigger it has regional implications it potentially has global implications recently on my podcast i had brett stevens on from the new york times where we talked about how do world wars actually start and you not to suggest that what's happening in the middle east is the beginning of a world war but there are these little flare-ups that draw in major powers. And certainly Moscow, Beijing, and Washington are all very involved in what's happening right now in the Middle East, which is basically, from a distance, one could dimi dis diminish or dismiss as just a border dispute between, you know, the, at the Gaza-Israel border. But it feels much bigger to most people with good reason. And so I think it's drawn interest uh, in the podcast because we've been going two, three times a week since October 7th with Israelis on the ground explaining what's going on. Key point, with Israelis on the ground. Dan, you have a very approachable way of doing an interview as well. It's not rushed, it's not cluttered, and you're very deliberate in listening and interrupting at the right time and asking the right question. I re-listened to your latest Aviv Reddit Gur interview last night after dinner, just to prepare for today, and it struck me. I listened to Daniel Hartman and Yossi Klein Halevi. I listened to Yonit Rav, uh, what, Lenit Levy and Jonathan Friedland. Yonit Levy, yeah. Yeah, I listen yeah. to them all. But you, yours has brought home this, especially with Haviv. Everybody's going to funerals around the clock in Israel. And I, I believe Americans love their country the equal of any people in the world love their country. But Israelis might love Israelis more than any other people love each other. What do you think about that? It's a small country. It is, uh, it is a country where everybody knows everybody or everybody's one degree removed from everybody. And there's a sense that particularly the October 7th massacre brought up the worst memories from Jews, even though Israel is a very diverse country. Over 70 nationalities are represented in Israel. So you have Jews from the United States and Europe. You have Jews from Iran, Iraq, Yemen, uh, Morocco, Turkey. You have Jews from the former Soviet Union. Um, so they've all in a sense, live these different histories, but they've all suffered from persecution no matter where they live. You have a Jew from Poland and a Jew from Baghdad. They've both lived under brutal repression for being Jews. And so October 7th touched a nerve for everybody in Israel, even though many of them have come from different places and have had different experiences. They, 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 they were all reminded 
about this um, this hate towards Jews that has existed throughout our history and the lengths those people who hate will go to massacre, to extinguish, to exterminate Jews. That was October 7th, like touched a visceral nerve in ways that that just brought back memories and brutal history. And so in that sense, there's an added layer of the country feeling very unified and feeling together. And my my sister who lives in Jerusalem, who I just spoke to late last night, my time, early morning, her time. I mean, this is what she does. She goes to funerals. She goes to shivas, which are the seven day mourning period for those families who've just lost a loved one. Um, Haviv, in our last episode of the podcast, said he's been to five funerals. That's actually I got to be honest, with you. that's on the low end. Most most Israelis I know um, are, are going to many more. Uh, and it touches every walk of life. The CEO of one of the biggest high tech companies in the country. His daughter was killed at the Nova Music Festival on October 7th. He's a billionaire. Uh, Lior Raz and Avi Sakharov, who are the co-creators of the television show Fauda. They're big deals in the television world globally. They have a big deal with Netflix. They, they're stars. Uh, uh, Lior Raz just got back from Malta shooting uh, a, a, a big film, uh, big, big, you know, um, Hollywood film in, in Malta. He just got back to Israel. Members of their crew from Fauda, from the production crew, have been killed. Uh, they're going to funerals. It's not... In the United States, most of our country is protected from military service and from war. It is, as you know, represents a minuscule percentage of the overall population. It's the opposite in Israel. Everyone in Israel is touched in some way, whether it's their own service, their children's service, a friends, a teachers, a shopkeepers, a brother. They're all touched by it. And so when 360,000 people out of a population of 9.1 million people are mobilized on top of those who are slaughtered on October 7th and on top of the hostages and on top of the rape survivors, everyone somehow knows someone. You know, I, I was listening at the beginning of the last episode to the discussion about Mitai, the uh, cousin of Haviv's wife, I believe, who was killed yeah, in action yeah, in close, Gaza. Yeah. And he sounds like, a, you know, you're talking about he looks like a bar mitzvah picture, uh, you know, 19 or 20 years old. These are young people. America took 7,000 casualties over 20 years. And you know that well, Dan, because you were with the uh, American, uh, 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 what do we call it, the authority, the coalition authority in Baghdad. Coalition you, authority in Iraq, yeah. yeah we, we react, and I, I know two people, one remove, who died among those 7,000. Too much more connected to more because I have a son, a son-in-law, and a, and a nephew on active duty, so I know a little bit. But nobody personally, everybody knows somebody personally in Israel, and that changes a country profoundly. Yeah, uh, yeah. I so I worked in Iraq, and I knew people who were killed. One person who worked particularly close with me when I was based in Baghdad, named Lieutenant Colonel Chad Buring. Uh, who was killed in the fall of 2003 with a with a uh, rocket attack against the uh, Al Rashid Hotel in the Green Zone? Um, but but that was I, I wouldn't have known Chad Buring had I not been serving. And right here's a, here I am living in New York City. I live a very in some respects a very sheltered uh, northeastern uh, very comfortable life in New York City. Had I not been serving in Iraq, I wouldn't have known Chad Buring. Most of my peers, most people in my world over here in New York don't know anybody who serves in the military, let alone who's given their lives. Uh, Israel, here's the thing, because there's almost near universal service, Hugh, it, it, it breaks down socioeconomic barriers. So in the hull of a tank in Israel, you have the son of a billionaire and you have the son of a cab driver serving together. You have the son of someone who's very religious, and then you have the son, uh, and then you have someone in the, in the hull of the tank who's got tattoos and a ponytail and is hyper secular. They, because they all have to serve, they have this shared experience. And, you know, you and I have talked previously about the politics of the country as divisive and polarizing as the politics of Israel can be. Unlike other countries in the West, I think the army, the military experience, that sense of service, the sense we're all in this together at all times, but especially after an event like October 7th, prevents the country from being torn apart. And Nitai, who's, who's uh, Haviv's close family friend uh, who died, yeah, I mean, I, I looked at the photo of him, of Nitai at, at Haviv and, and his wife Rachel's wedding, and he's the same age in that photo as one of my sons. And it gave me chills because it just... Um, I, I got to tell you, the other... Wait, 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 
breaks my heart is that they're like the next generation. That's they're the next generation of leaders. They're the next yet generation of contributors to the country. And to think so many of these lives are being lost is just so boy. They're going to be a hard nosed group. I'm going to come back with Dan during both breaks. We'll put it all in the podcast. We'll be back live on the 450 stations after the break. Stay tuned, America. Dan Senor's podcast is Call Me Back. His brand new book is. Uh, the genius of Israel. And if you really want to understand Israel, go get it. He also turned me on to Dan Gordis Israel, A Concise History of a Reborn Nation. Fabulous book. Get it all. I'll be right back. Back now with Dan Senor. Dan, I wanted to save this, this comment for off air because I don't want people to hear it unless they're intentionally listening to podcasts. They will have already heard it on yours. Everybody in the IDF is lying to their mother, father, or, mo- or their wife or husband about the danger they're in. <laughs> I found that it's kind of funny, but it's also, oh, not to worry about me. It's logistics. The food is bad. I'm, I'm fine. And, and uh, Mitai was in, a, in the front tank when he was killed. Everybody, and the, the paratrooper is not having lasagna in the back lines either. They're all on the front line. Gaza is a front line. Yeah, I mean, Gaza is, I mean, here's the irony. Israel is, as you know, is a tiny country. So not only is its population small, 9, 9.1, 9.2 million, but geographically, it's the size of the state of Rhode Island. So if you look at Sterot, which is the, the town on the most southern tip, southern part of the border of Israel, right by it, it's less than a mile from Gaza. There's a big, thriving community i've been there many times i think you've said you've been down south in israel before yeah i've been in the desert but i haven't haven't been down at the gaza border okay okay you we have a chapter in our in our new book we have a chapter on stay road it's 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 a it's a booming civilian middle class uh community it's 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 less than a mile from the gaza border then you say okay well that's on the border but what about the thriving cities like jerusalem and tel aviv and haifa okay take tel aviv it's the high-tech center of the country it's it's the most dynamic economic part of the country equivalent of new york city it's uh it's 40 miles from the gaza border so so the idea like every part of the country a is the front line i mean you're not it's like the difference as i said in our in our last episode of the podcast it would be like after 9 11 you know if manhattanites were told al-qaeda planned 9 11 from staten island and staten island is run by al-qaeda and oh, by the way, all of the Staten Island population has been indoctrinated by Al Qaeda. And now Manhattanites are said, OK, so what are you going to do about Staten Island? You're just going to go make peace with Staten Island. You're going to learn how to live with a radicalized Staten Island being run by Al Qaeda. Not in a million years. That's what Israel is to Gaza. So not only, Hugh, to your point, is it, anywhere you're serving in, in the country, you're basically on the front line. Most of those 360,000 troops who've been called up are actually in Gaza, not even inside Israel on the front line. They're in Gaza fighting. They're just lying to their Jewish mothers because they don't want to worry them. And, um, and, and the craziness, which is the point I tried to get home in this last drive home, this last episode of the podcast, the idea that Israel's being pressured to figure out its plan for who's going to govern Gaza after the war. Are you kidding me? Like, as though this is some simple thing. There's some quick fix. It literally would be saying to Manhattanites, yeah, Al-Qaeda was running Staten Island. But in a few weeks, we want you, Manhattan, to figure out how you're going to learn to live with Staten Island run by by Al-Qaeda. By the way, this is no no dig against Staten Island. I love Staten Island. This is just a it's, it's a it's Dan, analogy. were you in New it's York on 9-11? Uh, I was in New York uh, two days after 9-11. All right. When we come back from break, I want you to consider this as we as we pause. I think the big difference is that Americans saw the attack on 9-11 and thought there are a small group of people out there operating from a few bases in Afghanistan and we can stop them with TSA, et cetera. This is much larger and both proportionally and just in terms of number. There are so many fanatics in Hamas. We had no idea the level of depravity. And that's when you said they dialed up the fanaticism. I don't know if they dialed up or if we just took the curtain back. I'm going to ask you that after the break. Stay tuned, America. I'll be right back with Dan Senor, host of the Call Me Back podcast. Welcome back, America, to the worst pronounced Hebrew in the United States. That would be mine. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Dan Senor, though, can correct me. Uh, Dan, prior to 73, there was a conception in Israel that they could not be surprised. They were. I wonder if Fauda and other shows contributed to a new conception that is now shattered, that they would never be surprised and that the number of terrorists who could enter into the country could never get 
larger than the, the Hanak Tel Iran attack on the Haifa Highway or the other attacks in 73 that you detailed yesterday with Haviv. Do you think that was an illusion that spread out over Israel? Yeah, I think the combination, I think that there, there are many uh, misconceptions in the conceptia and the concept, uh, one of which was that uh, Hamas in Gaza wanted to govern rather than to wage war. There was a sense that, yeah, their, 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 their rhetoric is toxic, their rhetoric is, is um, radical, but at the end of the day, they, they have a population of 2.2 million people to run, and that's what they're focused on, not waging war against Israel. Is Waging war against Israel would be a distraction from developing and running Gaza. That was one big misconception. The second big misconception was the biggest threat to Israel from Gaza were rockets, not terrorists crossing the border. So if you look at the bomb shelters, so almost every Israeli home has a bomb shelter, apartment buildings, homes. I mean, my family members all have bomb shelters in their buildings or their homes. This is a common thing. And, and people in Israel are trained from a very young age how to get into the bomb shelter, depending on where in the country you are. When a rocket is launched from Gaza or from the north, you have, if you're in the center of the country, you have about 12 or 15 minutes to get to your bomb shelter. If you live in the south of the country, in Gaza, in, in um, Sterot, you have 15 seconds. Uh, to get into the bomb shelter, but these, but it is very common to know to run to the bomb shelters. None of the bomb shelters had locks on the doors. I mean, that's very revealing, and that's a very powerful symbol, very powerful metaphor. Why is that? On October seventh, when the Hamas terrorists came in, all these kids, for instance, at the Nova Music Festival or on these kibbutzim, they ran into their bomb shelters. That's what they were trained to do. And that was played right into Hamas's hands because they could then throw grenades into the bomb shelter. They could just walk into the bomb shelter, open the door and just start shooting and slaughtering people live. And people say, well, wait a minute, why weren't there locks in the bomb? Why couldn't we close the doors and lock the doors? Because the whole national security concept, conceptualization of the threat was we just need to be in the bomb shelters for when the rockets hit. No one ever thought about hand to hand combat. And terrorists actually going door to door and slaughtering people live the way those 2000 terrorists tried to do and did do on October 7th. And that there are so many, Hugh, there are so, I'm going to start dedicating in, in my podcast in the future some episodes to the lessons learned. And what I'm trying to do right now in the podcast is focus on educating people on the history of what Israel has been dealing with, because I find there's such a uh, deficiency in the level of knowledge that regular, even smart, intelligent people have about the history. So what I'm trying to focus on now is just the basic history. And then I'm going to pivot to what Israel got wrong and the lessons learned. And that speaks exactly to what you're talking about, which is this misconception. You know, Dan, you introduced me to Daniel Gordis, and I got his book, Israel, The Rebirth of a Nation Reborn. Concise history of a, of a nation reborn. I've listened to it two and a half times because I knew everything from 73 forward and I knew it pretty well. I didn't know much about 48 to 73. I read The Lion's Gate by Stephen Pressfield, a little bit about that. I knew nothing about Theodore Herzl to 1948. I didn't know about the pogroms. I didn't know about, yeah, I just don't know this. I know about the Holocaust. I'm an average, smart American reader of these things. So the, the great benefit of Call Me Back are the people you bring on. Haviv is not my age. He's not, he's not anybody of your listener's age. He's a young man with young kids. He's got to live in Israel for 50 years. He, they, it's got to have changed everyone, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, I, look, one of the th Haviv is a very special person, as you know, and I know you've had him on. Uh, I, I, he and I have become quite close. He's uh, he's special because he's he's obviously deeply intelligent. He's got a he's a sharp analyst, and he's got a tremendous sense of history. And he's a soulful person. He's living his life in Israel. He's raising his children in Israel. He has family members serving on the front lines. He himself has served, um, and so we try to do this weekly conversation uh, to to almost be like an audio journal for both of us. Since October seventh, we recorded our first episode of these weekly war check-ins since on October 8th. And I would say his biggest frustration, which he gets into in our most recent episode, the one you're referring to, and even our previous ones, is he says, the Palestinians don't have to love me. They don't have to be Zionists. They don't have to believe in Israel. But they need to understand me. That's his big point. And what they need to understand is, I'm not going anywhere. And I'm raising my kids to understand they're not going anywhere. This is their country. So you, you, you can be as angry about that fact as you are, 
But you have to deal with that fact. And so much of the palace, talk about Israel's misconception. Let's talk about the Palestinians' misconception, their conceptual conceptia. Their misconception was that they could, with enough pressure and violence and intimidation and October 7th slaughtering and rape, they could drive the Jews out. They could go somewhere else. And Haviv's point is, where? Where are we going? We got you, no don't, you, to go. don't you think the, they think America when he said that they think you're, that all Israelis are going to go to America and that's not going to happen. They built this amazing country. They're not going to leave it. Right. Uh, when we come back right, from break, right. I'm going to talk with Aviv for four more minutes about the fact that Israel has never publicly acknowledged being a nuclear power. But that's got to be in the background of some people's minds. And when it's about the Israeli Supreme Court decision, about which I have no opinion. It's not my court. I don't know their law. I teach American con law. I'd be happy to give you my opinions on American con law. But Americans holding forth on Israeli con law, don't listen to them. I'll be right back with Dan Sinor. Stay tuned. Back for a quick closing segment with Dan Sinor. Dan, uh, again, the, the, the podcast is such a public service. It's called po- Call Me Back a couple of times a week. I wish you had more time, but I know you got a day job. But I also want to talk yeah. to you about the fact that Israel's a nuclear power, at least I understand it to be. They never admit that. That's part of what I don't think the Sunni Arab states have managed to communicate to Hamas. Before Israel ever goes down, like the movie or the, the, the Broadway show, uh, Golda's Balcony, the temple weapons go up. They're not going to go out quietly. Uh, and if they ever go out, that, that do you think that the Sunni Arab world has communicated that to Hamas? I think so. Israel, as you said, has never publicly acknowledged that it is a uh, a nuclear power, but it is well known uh, that it is. And I think with Israel's deepening ties, with Jerusalem's deepening ties with Riyadh and 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 Abu Dhabi and Bahrain and other countries and Cairo, and I mean, I think these countries understand that Israel's a nuclear power, and I think Iran understands uh, that Israel's a nuclear power. I think there's a reason why the regional actors since 1973 have not the regional actors, meaning the state the state actors. Uh, have not waged another war at Israel, A, because they believe Israel knows how to fight big conventional wars, and they know Israel has, most likely, uh, this nuclear capability, uh, which is why the big regional powers, Iran really, have chosen to, to pressure Israel through proxies, through Hamas, through Palestinian Islamic Jihad, through Hezbollah, and now through the Houthis in Yemen, uh, they're relying on proxies because even if you have a nuclear capability, and unless you're willing to strike the source, Iran, of the funding and the arming of the uh, proxies, it's uh, uh, these proxies are much harder to deal with. And Israel, as we've seen now, is had increasingly less so now since October 7, but has historically had a hard time dealing with these proxies. I think the the mask is off. Uh, there's no there's no neat and tidy way to deal with these proxies. And I think that there's a consensus across the Israeli political spectrum now, across the political spectrum, from the hard right all the way to the hard left, that uh, that you talked, I mean, I talked to my Israeli friends who are literally on the high, hard, way hard left, you people I've never had an agreement with about Israeli national security policy in years. They all sound like they're singing from the same song sheet, that they have to do whatever they have to do with to crush Hamas, period, full stop. All right, last question. I don't think the Israeli Supreme Court issue will make a dent in American politics. I think Joe Biden's increasing calamitous policy towards Israel, especially the Houthis, will. And I expect the Chicago Convention to be reminiscent of 1968, which you won't remember, but which I do. This is dividing the American left in a way that we have not seen in my lifetime since the Vietnam War. Do you expect that to deepen? We have one minute, Dan Senor. Uh, look, I think uh, the Supreme Court issue, which I think is basically done for now because the Israeli uh, Supreme Court just struck it down in an in a eight to seven vote. But it actually the, there was a there was another vote in the in the decision, which was a 12 to three vote um, that would just narrow the reasonableness clause, which was this last piece of the Supreme Court reform of the of the judicial reform. I think the country is now consumed with war. It has a war to fight. They're not focused on judicial reform. If anyone in the U.S. wants to start focusing on judicial reform in Israel, it's preposterous. It's a domestic Israeli issue. Israel's a vibrant democracy. They work through their issues. Let them work it out. American politicians shouldn't be mucking around in domestic affairs of an ally at any time, especially during an existential war. 
But what about the divide on the American left? Will it show up in Chicago? I have a feeling it will, Hugh. I think uh, I what, what what we are seeing right now. I mean, I just in New York last night, in the last couple of days, what's happening at JFK Airport? The airport's been totally shut down basically because because these pro Palestinian protesters the invading. Space. I've got to stop you there. We have talked about that. I'm going to talk about it with Senator Cotton right now about getting the FBI on that. Dan Senor, call me back. Thank you for the service that you do. Appreciate your taking time with me. Thank you. Appreciate it, Hugh. Thank you. 